Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the Thomas Theatre, Coast Grove High School. A little bit different from our usual venue, but uh, I'm sure all of you at the back will have a better view than you normally have. But anyway, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Let me introduce our guests tonight, first of all, before we begin our evening. Uh, from the British Antarctic Survey, we have the engineering officer, Stephen Parker. Round of applause. Thank you. Well done, and to tell us all about the Buccaneer, Air Commodore Graham Pitchfall. Graham, thank you. Well done. Let's begin on a high note. Frank Bright, where are you? Where's Frank? Hello, oh, Frank. Right, Frank has been awarded an honorary degree. Is that the UCS? The UCS in Ipswich? It's to be presented to Frank um, uh, in the Town Hall on the 24th of October. And it's presented to him for the work that he's done on talking to school children, to various groups, <laughs> authorities, etc., on the Holocaust. I'll decorate it. And uh, Frank, as most of you will know, has first-hand experience of that, and so he's in uh, a good position to tell the children about what went on in those horrible places. So Frank, from all of us, well done and congratulations. <laughs> Remember it's Sunday, and we have our service, of course, on Marklesham Heath at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but, but, the Royal British Legion would like your help uh, for collecting for on the poppy appeal. Now, I'm going to do it, and I know that perhaps one or two others of you are already perhaps signed up. But I have the name here of Marjorie and Graham White, who live on Marklesham Heath, and they are... Um, controlling or in charge of, if you like, the Royal British Legion collection at Tesco. You have noticed his newsletter note. So if you are a member of the MHAS, then you will have a newsletter out there for you. If you haven't, if you're not a member and you'd like to join, then Joe Cox, where's Joe? Joe with his hand up over there is going to sit out in the break time and if you want to fill up the form and join, uh, then you can have a newsletter. Uh, right, I think that's probably it. Our now. first guest this evening. And uh, this is a gentleman who has uh, taken part, he's the engineering officer, as I said earlier, uh, to the British Antarctic Survey Team. So ladies and gentlemen, with a talk entitled The Story of Antarctic Aviation, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Stephen Parker. Stephen. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I just, just before I start, just give you a bit of my background. I spent 23 years in the Royal Air Force as a mechanic and a fitter, and I retired in 1990 and was privileged to be able to uh, take up an appointment with British Antarctic Survey. And I spent 19 years with the survey, basically looking after the maintenance, the operation for Twin Otters and R-7. And this is a little bit of a new uh, show for me, and I've never talked to so many people. It's usually a pint in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll start off with uh, the Antarctic. Would you, like uh, the, would you like the lights out, Stephen? Sorry? Would you like the lights out? Um, I'd like a little bit of light over here in case I get that. Okay. Let me, uh, <clears> I'll take the Is that good? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's fine for me. <clears throat> uh, the Antarctic. Well, at the bottom of the world, as most of you know, and probably uh, one day, occasionally when you see it on the news, what actually goes on down there, what's it all about? Well, the Antarctic continent 
was first circumnavigated in 1773 by Captain Cook. And it wasn't till the late 1800s that anybody actually started to actually uh, land in Antarctica. And this was mostly done by whalers and sealers who, having uh, raped the Arctic, were now going to start raping the Antarctic because it was rich in seals and wildlife, uh, whales particularly. So, uh, 1899 was the first wintering party ever to winter down in the Antarctic, and it was the Belgica, uh, Belgica all that. The Antarctic is actually five and a half million square miles, so to give you an idea of its actual size, it's the size of, twice the size of Australia, size of America and Mexico put together, and it has no indigenous population whatsoever. Most of the wildlife is round the coast and only goes inland probably about a mile However, in 1902, Scott became the first aeronaut when he actually took his balloon, Eva, up to 800 feet in the Antarctic. And this was the very first ascent aeronautical uh, ascent in Antarctica. And it was, he only did it once, went up to about 800 foot, came down, and then Shackleton, again synonymous with the Antarctic and exploration, he went up in it and did the first aerial photography. So Captain Scott was actually the first aeronaut and Shackleton was the second. Then Eric, sorry, Eric von Trigalski, who was a German who was in the same area with a ship on a scientific expedition, he also, in March of 1902, he also ascended uh, he to about six a, a second uh, expedition in 1933-34, which he used a Curtis Wright Condor. And this was more of a, a scientific expedition, uh, a reconnaissance expedition, aerial photography, than they get to the South Pole and return and have all the glory. So he used the Curtis Wright which was a bit of a, clump, a lumbering thing, but at the end of the, end of the day, these aeroplanes, he took them down on the ship, and then they reassembled them on the... Yes. Oops. Did you? Hang on a minute, okay? Yeah. What I would like to ask is about the DC-3s. Presumably they are completely newly built, not uh, old ones. No, they, they are actually all DC-3s with the original construction number, and they're actually completely stripped out, completely refurbished, yeah. and basically come out, of the, come out of the shop with the same original maker's plate, but actually as a, all the modifications to accept the... Uh, PT6 yeah. uh, engines and are fully modified with modern aircraft, and, aircraft and, and hurt himself and uh, recuperated it. Uh, I think it was probably Bridge House, although they called it Bridge Cottage in Playford. He stayed with one of the other uh, test pilots who uh, had obviously either bought or rented that, that particular property. So, a lovely story and, yeah. and a connection there, Stephen, with Marshall. It was beautiful. Yeah, absolutely marvellous. It's a, and it's interesting that nearly 100 years later we've actually found some of the aeroplane because most of it is uh, either blown away. Where, they, where actually Bickerton was and, and Mawson's base at uh, uh, Commonwealth Bay is actually the most windiest place in Antarctica and the average wind speed is like 50 or 56 miles an hour and in one of his seasons in a year they had three days when there was no wind. That's why Mawson's book's called The Home of the Blizzard. Patience was a virtue in those days. Stephen, thank you very, very much for a really interesting talk. <laughs> the subject that um, is very rarely talked about in such depth, but the aviation aspect of it, we knew would be exciting for you here this evening. So, once again, Stephen, thank you very, very much indeed for coming to, to see us here tonight. Right. I'll enjoy it. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you
So many different areas. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Air Commodore Graham Pitchfork, who's come this evening to talk to us from quite a long way away, I hasten to add. He's come to talk about the Buccaneer and its operational service with the Fleet Air Arm and the RAF. So please, everybody, a very warm welcome yeah. from Graham. Thank you very much. It's the first time I've been given a prize before the lecture, so uh, <laughs> I hope uh, you're going to enjoy it. It's a great pleasure to be back here at uh, Martin Trim Heath. Uh, for my experience of travelling around the country, which I do extensively to give talks, uh, it's got to be one of the most active of the aviation societies and uh, best supporters. So it's a very great pleasure for me to be back here. Now, I should give you a health warning at this stage. When I get talking about the Buccaneer, there's no idea what time it's likely to finish. So <laughs> I will endeavour to keep in time, because uh, I'm conscious of the late hour already. And the only other thing I would say before we start, just so that you know what to expect, uh, this is not a technical lecture. I'm not going to discuss... Uh, other than very, very briefly, I want to ask you, the technical side of the airplane, we're going to talk about what we did with it, uh, how we operated it, what it made, minesweepers and patrol craft. But with its uh, urge to push communism to the wider world, it decided it had got to join the great powers and become a global navy. And the very first uh, major post war ship of the Soviet fleet was this Sperlock cruiser. Um, this is a photograph I took off Land's End, oddly enough, as it's refueling from an oiler. Uh, they were very prominent in the North Atlantic. It was a very potent ship. And in 1952, uh, the Royal Navy put out a, a requirement, uh, an air staff requirement, uh, for an aircraft to tackle uh, the Sverdlov. And it was the Naval Air Specification 39, NA 39. Uh, and that was in 1952. And I'm only going to refer to my notes very briefly because I want to get some dates out so that you can appreciate the rate at which airplanes were developed and brought into service. It's worth pointing out at this very early stage, of course, that the Buccaneer never had dual controls, ever. Uh, and so the guy in the back, which uh, on over 2,000 hours worth was me, uh, with various pilots of varying aptitudes, uh, and uh, he was a brave guy, I think, as a pilot, to sit in the back, knowing he had no control over the airplane. It was a successful flight, and of course the test program then uh, got underway quite quickly. It was an interesting test program because they decided to build 20 prototypes. We call them development batch aircraft. And the idea of this was that by bringing out so many so quickly, each airplane could be effectively devoted to one particular aspect of the test program. And therefore it could speed the whole thing up. Um, and, and it worked. Um, these were very basic airplanes. The first three, they had no auto stabilization. If you look at the fin top, the, the, there were modifications that came later on, so it didn't look quite like that. But they did their job uh, very well. So these were the pre production airplanes, and they, uh, the latter ones of those went to the Navy to start their trials. Of course, the, uh, it had to work off the deck, so. Uh, it got to a point where it was time for the deck trial. Without the LGBs, we would not be able to do take those bridges out, and that was true. So uh, it was now time to say goodbye, uh, March uh, 19. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that was the last old British bomber, the Buccaneer. Thanks very much, Graham. That's an old boy's story, that one. It was a bit of a rush, I'm afraid, but I'm very conscious of the time. So, no, uh, absolutely, brilliant. I think that uh, everybody's appreciative of that, because time is getting on, I know. But, um, questions, anybody? Very quickly? Anybody got any questions? Yes, yes. Jim. Can you shout, Jim? Oh, or? I've never, never studied a, a Buccaneer quite so much as I have today. No, what we had, um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I would have gone into this in a bit more detail if I had slightly more time. What we had, um, you remember I mentioned about going onto a carrier, we had to um, get the speed back. Now we could do that uh, by the carrier going faster, but we had a very clever device on the airplane called boundary layer control. And we bled air off the engines and fed it over the leading edge of the wings of the tailplane. 
And this uh, gave us extra lift, which meant we could approach slower. It gave us 17 knots to uh, left. We could land 17 knots slower. And we blew this air over the, the uh, surface uh, of, the, of the wing. And we had flaps, and we had ailerons which drooped. And that's why we had the tail flame flap for the, for the moment. So you would use flaps, which are actually quite small, uh, in the normal sort of way. And we had three configurations. And uh, you'd put a little bit of flap down to start with, and they were always coordinated with the ailerons. And we had little gauges, and you had to watch them because if they were out of synchronization, particularly the tailplane, you'd get a hell of a pitch moment. And of course, in the early days, we lost two Mark II like that. Uh, so they're ganged together, and as you progressively slow down, at 180, we go to the next stage of flap, that they're ganged together. So you'd now get 30 degrees of flap and 20 degrees on the ailerons. And of course the tailplane flaps going up with the other ones at 20 degrees. And then we land at 45, 25, 25 with the boundary layer control on. Now if for any reason you lost boundary layer control, you lost 17 knots, well that was no good on a carrier, so you'd have to find the diversion air fuel somewhere. But if you're sure, you know the matter, you just make you land at 17 knots faster and you just want a bit further down the runway. But you never land, but you'd have a different flap aileron droop configuration because at 45 degrees and 25 degrees of droop yeah, and no what, air. That's what I noticed. Yeah. So um, it, it was a fantastic uh, idea and, and I, can, I can hardly remember as ever having a low failure. Uh, we had a few synchronization problems in the early days and we did lose one or two airplanes but uh, once they nailed that uh, it, it was a great idea and we would never have been able to operate on the carrier with you went to Congress. Um, yeah. Did you meet up with Frank Cox? Well, Frank? Yeah. Oh, my God. You remember I told you about my cabin? Yeah. And I had a young sub lieutenant, two of us, but for a year, Frank was the other half. <laughs> <laughs> my, I, and he couldn't have been better. We were the only two chaps on our squadron that stayed together. I didn't fly with him, but I had a cabin with him. Yeah. And we were the only two that never split up. And we got on that well. Yeah, he's a super chap. Great chap. I'll be seeing him in a few weeks. Uh, I'm not sure Sorry? Yeah, the single retard defense. You roll one by, drop a couple of bombs out, take out five of the hard. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We had all sorts of tricks like that to scare them. Yeah, uh, what you're referring to is, um, I mean, this is the last ditch. <laughs> um, we could drop um, in the bomb bay, uh, additional to the nukes, we could drop 4,000 pounders, but we could also drop four cluster bombs, the BL 755, which are now, of course, uh, verboten, the uh, anti tank weapon. But we, uh, but we didn't always toss our bombs. We did dive bombing and we did low level attack. Two of the feet, we dropped them, and then we'd have a parachute come out the back to retard the bomb whilst we got away. Um, and our last ditch effort, if the guy in the back was getting, you know, whoever, a fighter was getting a bit persistent, getting a bit close, we'd roll the bomb doors and drop a bomb in front of him. <laughs> and that sure as hell altered his aim. <laughs> no, it's true. It was a, it was a last ditch. And, uh, in the happening red flag where someone yeah, yeah. popped a couple of yeah. uh, yeah. bombs out yeah. and they reckoned that the guy behind him would smoke. That's right. Yeah. Right, Graham. I'm gonna we're gonna have to close yeah. there because we've got to vacate the hall by eleven o'clock. <laughs> but anyway, what a super, super talk. Thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah, well, uh, We've had a, a good contrast of two very good speakers. Stephen, thank you for talking about the cold <laughs> and the wind and the civilian stuff that went on there. It was absolutely fascinating to know. I, I learned a tremendous amount from this tonight about what went on. You don't hear about things like this, do you? It's only on when we get a speaker like this. So thank you for that, and Air Commodore, Graham, <laughs> Graham. <laughs> thank you very much for yours. Uh, I think that uh, you know, we know a lot more about the operations of the 
back in here. But I did actually, I, I, I snuck up on you a bit. I looked you up on some of your flights. Oh. <laughs> I do know that in the Terry Canyon one, you had a hang up with bomb. That's right. <laughs> on another occasion, you had a bird strike. A bad one. <laughs> <laughs> and from looking at your adventures with buccaneers, there were numerous occasions when little snags caused a cancellation because although it was a highly technical aircraft, uh, there were lots of things that could go wrong very quickly. That's right. Yeah, and it was an exciting time. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I, th I think, you know, we've, we've had a master, master, masterful display on this. I certainly know a lot more about operations in the post-war years. And to cut it very shortly, thank you very much indeed Pleasure. to both of you. And could I just add one final thing? Thank you, Howard, for booking two very good speakers for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah.